So was it an execution? Or was it a sacrifice? Or was it both? Was it both an execution and a sacrifice? Before we get into the crucifixion a little bit, which I think is um, a necess it's necessary for us to meditate on the crucifixion. I don't think it's an option for us who are disciples of Jesus Christ. I think we must. Uh, I'll talk about why I think we must. But first, as we walked through Lent, we were walking through the source and summit of all Christian life, the Mass, how incredibly important it is. We talked about two significant aspects, covenant, sacrifice, also communion. So if we go back in time in the Passover, the Israelites were slaves of the Egyptians. They slaughtered a lamb. They took the blood of the lamb and they put it on the door post and the lintel and the angel of death passed over and no Israelite, no Hebrew was died that day. The blood kept them from dying. And then we go fast forward about a thousand something years. Jesus celebrates the Passover. He changes it in significant ways. It becomes the last supper, it becomes our first mass, the first source and summit of all Christian life ever celebrated. And there's no lamb there. He says, this is my body, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. All offering. We miss it, but it's all sacrificial language. Where's the sacrifice? There. The next day. Because when covenants, which were bonds created by God with his people, persons, tribes, families, sacred bonds created or restored by God, there was a sacrifice, and there was a bloody sacrifice, and then there was renewal of those covenants. That's what Passover was. It was a renewal of that covenant, and it was a sacrifice. So that's what Jesus became. He was the lamb. That's why we hear John the Baptist say, behold, the lamb of God. That's exactly what he's talking about. He's the lamb. Instead of the lamb being slaughtered at Passover, now it's Jesus. Every day, in addition to the Passover, which was only celebrated once a year, annually, they did the Tamid, which was a whole burnt offering sacrifice in the temple. Holocaust, we call it. They would take a lamb at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m. every day, and they would offer that lamb up. They would burn it. Jesus is led out to crucifixion at 9 a.m., the Gospels tell us. He dies at 3 p.m., the Gospels tell us, at that hour, the same time as the sacrifice of the Tamid, and he is the Lamb of God. Theologically, at every Mass, we are present at that sacrifice. Now, we can talk about that theologically, but I think we need to talk about it maybe psychologically, emotionally, as well as spiritually. I don't know if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. I was reading a critique of it today. It was interesting, the critique. He was looking at it, he thought he, a lot of it seemed to be a critique at uh, the producer, Mel Gibson. And maybe he thought he saw some anti-Semitic tones in there. It was interesting. The first time I saw The Passion of the Christ, and I would recommend any adult see it. I would not recommend children see it. First time I saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, I've never, I don't think I cried so much in my life. And I cried in the theater, and I cried in a very public way. It was incredibly moving for many ways for me. I don't really want to watch it again. I watched it maybe once or twice since then. It's not something that I really want to watch. It's horrific. And I think Mel Gibson wanted to portray the reality of the horror. And I think uh, the critiques and the critics don't want to see that horror. But I think we have to. I think we have to. There's many ways. I was reading Aquinas and Augustine's discussions of why. Why, why that? To save us. Was that necessary? Could not have God saved us another way? And of course, Augustine and Aquinas both say, yes, absolutely. God could have saved us in another way. Although once committed, then it became necessary, as Aquinas would say. In the Old Testament, as we see, the, hear, see and hear the prophecies, right? 
Jesus fulfills all these Old Testament prophecies, some that we don't even think of or know of. In Zechariah, 30 pieces of silver, the price they paid for me, an Old Testament book, long, long before Judas portrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. That's just one. There's many prophecies in the Old Testament. So why did it move me so much? Why did it bring me to tears, this crucifixion? The Romans perfected it. I've read that the Persians started in three, two, three, four hundred BC, but also the Carthaginians did it. The Romans tried to extract the most amount of pain they could in this. They did it for fear, and they did it out of power, and they did it for control. If you mess with Rome in a certain way that we don't like, we will do this to you. All the apostles knew. All the Jewish people at the time knew what a crucifixion was. They had all seen it. The closest we've seen it is, again, the movie The Passion of the Christ. It was horrendous what they did. The lines are so simple in the gospel, right? They took him out and scourged him. We hear it. It's a simple sentence. But what they did was they probably had a whip of nine tails. In other words, one whip, nine branches they had either bone or metal on the edge of those branches. When they scourged him, it would rip the skin and the tendons and the muscles. It would rip flesh right off his body. And it would start from his shoulder all the way down. He was probably without clothes when they did it. The Romans, I read, the Roman guards, when they did this, I read they were drunk because it was so barbaric <laughs> that they had to almost detach themselves in a sense from what they were doing. Sometimes we see Jesus depicted with the spikes in his hand. Possibly in the terminology could have been a spike. Hand or wrist was the same thing. After they scourged him, they put the crown of thorns on him. The pain was beyond what you and I, we can't even really guess at that pain, I don't think, most of us. It's where the word excruciating came from. It came from crucifixion. He was in excruciating pain. And that was just with the scourging and the crown of thorns. And they scourged him close to death, but they didn't want him to die because they wanted him to die on the cross. And maybe they were particularly cruel to Christ because the good thieves next to him probably weren't scourged the way he was. And he walks to the cross and he can barely carry it. And Jesus was probably in very good shape because he was an artisan, a carpenter, a stone worker. He walked everywhere. <laughs> he was probably in extremely good shape. And as he struggles up to Calvary, falls, can barely move, being kicked, being goaded, being made fun of, being stripped. They get him up to Calvary. They strip his clothes off, probably, open up all his wounds again. Bleeding profusely. They, doctors have tried to discuss what did he die from? Did he die from lack of blood? Did he die from uh, trauma? Did he die from blunt force? Did he? When they crucified him and put the spikes through his hand and his, his feet, waves of agony, there's nerve endings in both those places. And they were going right through those. It, the, the pain would have been unfathomable. He was on the cross for hours. He probably died of asphyxia. He probably died of asphyxiation because he couldn't exhale. He had to push up to exhale his breath and probably the carbon monoxide dioxide, I forget which we have there, would have poisoned him eventually. He wasn't getting enough oxygen. And eventually he died. Gets back to that question, why? Could you not have saved us another way, Lord? And the answer is yes. But like the critique of the Mel Gibson, he missed some incredibly fundamental points, and I don't, know, I don't understand how he can miss that. I want you to let go of any vengeful idea. God is angry and vengeful, and that's why, that's, let that go. Let that go. That's an act of love. 
That's an act of unmerited, undeserved love. Do you and I deserve to be loved like that? No. No, we really don't deserve to be loved like that. Now, I know sometimes we would say we would die for people, and I think we would. But Jesus knew what that crucifixion was before he did it. He knew the trauma, and he could have walked away from that. What do we take from that? And there's a couple reasons you can look at why the crucifixion. Because Jesus loves you that much. Because you have great value and dignity. Because the creator of the world, of a universe 43 billion light years wide, creator of everything that exists, did that because he loves you, loves you. That's what you want to take away from that. You want to take away from that that you have value and dignity not because of anything you've done, but because you were so, so loved. That's one of the reasons we say how highly he valued us, how greatly he loved us. Another reason we can look at it is he's showing us how to love. Jesus shows us how to love. Aquinas' definition is to die for oneself for the good of the other. To die to oneself for the good of the other. Jesus is showing what it means to love us and to love the Father. Obedient unto death, we hear in Hebrews. There's nothing that will stop me from loving God or loving you. That's what Jesus is saying. That's a perfect love. We approach it. With the grace of God, we can maybe come close. There's no qualifiers in his love. It is unconditional. And to love is sacrifice and sacrifice is to die to self for the good of the other. And sacrifice leads to communion. Sacrifice leads to communion. Also, Aquinas and Augustine talk about the debt. We say, hey, our Lord did that incredible thing for us because of our sins. You and me, ours. And we see the tragedy of sin. Sometimes we want to dismiss sin, our individual and corporate as humans, and say, ah, it's not that much, it's not that bad. No, it, it really is that much, that bad. But despite that, despite that, our Lord loves us. And no matter what we've said, no matter what we've done, no matter our apathy, our indifference, our lack of care and concern for what he did, our rejection, our sin. We look at that crucifix and we say, he loves us. He loves us. He's the greatest warrior we've ever had. He came to do battle for us. You can say he battled three things, sin, death, and Satan. And he didn't use any weapons other than one. Love. God's righteousness, the creator of the world, the most powerful entity that exists. Battled for us with no weapons. And not through power. But through love, righteousness, and seemingly weakness. But no greater battle, no greater soldier, no greater warrior than our Lord Jesus Christ. You must meditate on this. We are ungrateful people at times. We sometimes feel we're not valued. We sometimes forget how we're loved. We sometimes forget that sin is real. We sometimes forget that we owe God everything. We must meditate on this crucifixion. You are loved. And you are redeemed. And in the end of Hebrews it says, 
He became the source of eternal life for all who obey him. To follow him. That's our role in the covenant. To love God with our heart, soul, strength, and mind. To love our neighbor as ourselves. I wonder sometimes if we could love God if he had not done that the way we're called to. It's easy to say I love you. You can tell anybody you love them. We know it by what they do, not by what they say. Jesus loves you.